Hey guys, it's Jack Jack and welcome back to my channel and welcome to another Bible study. Today we're going to go over Luke chapter 2. It is a chunky one and I don't want to break this up into two parts. So without further ado, let's just go ahead and jump right on into it. The Bible I'm using is the Jesus Bible. I'll have it linked below. And the sections we're going to read about are the birth of Jesus, Jesus presented in the temple, and the boy Jesus at the temple. So those are the three sections. So without further ado, let's go ahead and begin with Luke chapter 2, verse 1, the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius... Cru I probably said that wrong, was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So a census, I mean, you probably know what a census is because we have to do those every so often as well here. But it's just a tally of like all the people under each household or within each family. So it's like, how many people do we have here? So they get an idea of the population and how many people are in each household. Verse four, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. So that's like where he registered for the census because he was part of that family. Verse five, he went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no guest rooms available for them. So they're in the process of traveling. This birth did not take place like in the comfort of her home or like in a planned area. They were literally traveling to do the census and she was in labor and about to give birth. And there was no rooms at any of the inns, like the hotels, the motels, like there was no rooms for them. So she literally gave birth in a field and put him in a manger. And the significance of this just shows how humbly Jesus came into this world. Like, yes, Jesus is the king of kings, but even he said it, I'm like jumping way ahead here, that the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. Like Jesus came to lead as an example and die on a cross for those who believe in him. And although he had every right and power to live as a king should, nowhere in his lifetime did he ever, like, did he ever portray that or like seek that. He lived such a humble life. And even the story of his birth shows the beautiful humbleness of our king. Verse eight, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. Again, we mentioned this in the last video, but I could only imagine how how terrifying that is to not only see an angel in front of you, but like the glory of the Lord surrounding them. Like it must be a terrifying or like super overwhelming sight because every single time it says like people were terrified, people were afraid. Verse 10, it says, but the angel said to them, here we go, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy. Hold on. For all the people. But do you see how the angels always, like always start with the same greeting? Do not be afraid. So there must be something just so terrifying about their appearance and like just being in the glory of the Lord. Verse 11. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So that was the message that the angel had given to the shepherds. And I believe in some translations, it says like the wise men, but I'm reading the NIV version and it says shepherds. Verse 13, suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Wait, I've never thought about that before. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared. So not only was the angel an overwhelming sight, 
but he brought company too. <laughs> Verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Verse 16, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger, just like the angel had said. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. I've always been so like fascinated by that reaction. Like everyone around that's hearing is amazed, but Mary just kind of holds this information in her heart and just kind of thinks about it. And I would imagine like childbirth alone being a very overwhelming experience and then receiving this incredible news and really prophecy for this child, which she had already heard from the angel before she had given birth. So like she was already aware of these things, but to hear it again, maybe it wasn't that she didn't need to be amazed because she knew this information already. So she just like held on to it in her heart because she knew the truth and she knew that this was just like confirming information. Verse 20, the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So just as the angels had told them, like everything the angel said, the shepherds are seeing right now in real time, like this is all happening and this is all real. Verse 21, on the eighth day, when it came time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. And again, just to recap from what we've talked about last time, um, the name Jesus means God saves in Hebrew. So now we're going to move into Jesus presented in the temple. Verse 22, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated, cons, cons, consecrated to the Lord. I don't know why I could not say that, but that comes from Exodus 13 verse 2 and verse 12. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. And that comes from Leviticus 12, 8. So they brought him to the temple. They were following all these, um, all these laws that were written back in the Old Testament, following this order to present the firstborn male and consecrate him, which basically means set him apart dedicate him to the Lord and set him apart as like the firstborn. So when you read in the Old Testament, you read about these laws and like these offerings that you give to the Lord. And it, it's, it talks about the first fruits a lot as being like the best, like you give the best, the first ones to the Lord, you dedicate that to the Lord. So when it comes to your offsprings, the firstborn male, like that's was considered like that's your first fruit that's your best like dedicate that to the lord so presenting him to the lord is not only like honoring to the lord by following those laws and presenting your firstborn but also honoring to that firstborn which i mean in this case it's jesus it's setting him apart for something greater and bigger and holy verse 25 now there was a man in jerusalem called simeon who was righteous and devout he was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the customs of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Oh my goodness, how amazing is that moment? Here was this man who was righteous and devout. He honored the Lord, followed the Lord, and it was revealed to him that he would see the Messiah before he dies. Like he would see with his own eyes, the Messiah. And because he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he, he knew the moment he held Jesus, that this was the Messiah. And so he's like, I can go in peace now because I have seen what you revealed to me, Lord. Like this is the Messiah. 
I can go in peace. And my favorite line here, I circled it, verse 32, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Like, he knew that Jesus didn't come just for his people, which were the Jews, right? He did not come just for them. Like, he knew in this moment that this Savior, this Messiah, is for Gentiles also, which means non-Jews. So everybody else who's not a Jew, that's me. And I mean, I don't know who's watching on the other side, but that's most likely you too. So I just wrote in my Bible, thank you, Jesus, like pointing at that verse right there, like a light of revelation for the Gentiles. Verse 33, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Well, this is like huge. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. That's like a huge, that's a huge like prophecy that he's giving to Mary right now. And this is not all like sunshines and rainbows. He's like being very serious about this. Like, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and be a sign that will be spoken against. So he's not saying, oh, people are going to stand with your child and people are going to be for your child. He's saying people are going to go against your child. But it's so that the hearts of many will be revealed, which, okay, jumping ahead again, I get too excited sometimes. We know that the whole issue is that Jesus ran into when it came with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they went against Jesus and it revealed their hearts, how just how darkened and hard their hearts were. But he's saying that's going to reveal the thoughts of many hearts and a sword will pierce your own soul too. So he's saying, Mary, you're going to suffer greatly too. A sword is going to pierce your soul and you're going to feel a great pain which she did by seeing her own son be crucified. Verse 36, there was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Pen Penuel? Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. Let me stop there because how cool is that to see a woman prophet? This is a verse I forget about very easily because it's, it's, it's such a small verse in here, but how cool is that to see a woman prophet? Many people think a wo women were not special, like back in the old old times. When you read the Bible, like women were not special. They were not cared for, which couldn't be further from the truth. Like Jesus's whole ministry, he cared for the women that were part of his ministry. Um, there were, even before Jesus, there were women prophets. There were women leaders. Look at the judges. Wasn't there Deborah? Wasn't she one of them? Or even look at, the story of Esther, her becoming queen. Like women did such cool and amazing and powerful things in scripture that are so easily overlooked. And so I just love that alone. Like let's read about this woman prophet, Anna. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day fasting and praying. Coming up to them at the very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Verse 39, when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. What an awesome moment of Jesus being presented in the temple and just the prophecy that was said on his life and just people worshiping and praising and and knowing like okay this child is going to be a redeemer so i can only imagine what that walk home was like for joseph and mary like i mean there there was some hardness to it like when he prophesied about the difficulties but it also must have just felt really reassuring and exciting to know that this child that they're holding and caring for and raising is going to do amazing things for the world. I can only imagine how empowering that must have felt 
and like how exciting. Okay, yes, I have an apron on now. I had to take a little quick pause to work on some bagels, but we are gonna finish up this last section, which is the boy Jesus at the temple. Every year, Jesus's parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. So doing like what was normal, what was traditional, and after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were not aware of it, which just cracks me up because like, how did you start traveling home and realize like your son, 12 year old, like big kid, how come he's, he's not walking beside you unless they were like part of a, a huge like caravan of people that I, then I would understand like, oh, easily like misplacing him or thinking he's with somebody, you know, then I understand. But if it was just them two traveling by themselves, like how did you forget your son? Verse 44, thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. So they must have been with like a big caravan of people. Cause then I could see like, I could see them getting mixed up that way. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. Okay, that just kind of confirmed it. So I was just speaking too soon. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Keep in mind, he's 12 years old and here he is impressing the people around him with his understanding, his questions and his answers. Verse 48, when his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Jesus is so funny. I feel like Jesus is so funny, even in his youth. Like, look at his response. Verse 49. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Basically saying, like, you, you know me. Like, why are you surprised that I stayed here in the temple, like in my father's house? Verse 50. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And that wraps it up for this last section. But man, I bet Jesus definitely got an earful on the way home. His parents, I'm sure, were not happy, even though they found him in the temple courts, like in his father's house. He wasn't like off being like, a little rascal and like being mischievous or anything like he stayed behind to stay in the temple to learn more and it said two times here within this chapter that Jesus grew in wisdom he was already impressing people at the age of 12 but just continue to grow in wisdom which I think is so amazing and also I think a calling for us to never stop learning and never stop growing I've said this many times but even with reading the Bible or anything you do in life, there's never going to be a point where you know everything because no matter what it is, you'll always learn something new or like things will change. But here's the amazing thing. God's word never changes, yet you will still never come to a point where you know everything because there's just so much in here. You could reread this over and over and over again, hundreds of times within your lifetime and still learn something new every day. That's how amazing God's word is, and it's not because it's changing, it's not. God's word remains the same, yesterday, today, and forever. But we can always learn more, and that's us growing in wisdom. The Holy Spirit can reveal something new to us every single time we open scripture. And that's what I love so much because I've reread the same stories over and over again, but I really do feel like every single time I read it, I learn something new or I have a different takeaway. And so that's why I love ending these videos with like, what was your favorite part or what was your biggest takeaway? What spoke to you? Because at first read, it could be one thing and then come back and read it again. It could be another thing. And that's what's so cool about the Holy Spirit and how he just moves in us and how we grow and like our eyes open to seeing the truth even more. So I, I think it's really exciting. So that concludes Luke chapter two. I'm dying to know in the comments, what was your biggest takeaway? What was your favorite part? I think for me, the verse 32 just is really special. And I am so grateful that Jesus extends salvation 
to all who believe. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter the things of your past. If you choose to believe in Jesus, he opens his arms. Literally on the cross, he opens his arms stretched out wide for all who believe in him. And I'm so grateful for that. And so when it says a light for revelation to the Gentiles, I, I'm just so grateful for the gift of Jesus on that cross, the gift of salvation and the sacrifice that was made. And I know we're not there yet. We're still reading about young Jesus, but just that verse alone, that prophecy is so exciting to me. And that's a call out to you. Well, if you're a Gentile, I'm a Gentile. So that's a call out to me. And so that's why it's really special. And that part definitely sticks out to me in this reading. I also love reading about the prophet Anna. I think it's so exciting when we read about the powerful roles that women played in scripture because it's so easy to overlook that. I just love everything about the birth of Jesus. It's all so, so exciting. And Christmas is right around the corner and I'm so excited to just hear about the birth of Jesus told at church like they do every year, but it just gets me so excited to celebrate Jesus and his birth. But that wraps it up for Luke chapter two. Next week, I'll be sharing Luke chapter three. So make sure you subscribe and turn on the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new uploads. And I will see you guys next time. Thank you for joining me for another Bible study. Bye. Mm -hmm.